Please turn in your Bibles this morning to Revelation chapter 1 and beginning of verse 3. And this is 1028 if you're using the Pew Bible this morning. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it. For the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your precious word, and especially we thank you for the great gift of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, that he came into this world to free us from our sins by his blood, and he will be coming again to rule and reign on this earth and make everything right. (coughs) We long for that day, Father. We ask that you would help us to uh, continue to have a biblical hope in the return of your Son, Jesus Christ, to pull us through whatever we might be facing here and now. We also ask, Father, if there be anyone here this morning who's not yet received your Son as their Lord and Savior or acknowledged him as King, we ask that today, through your Spirit, you'd stir in their hearts and enable them to repent and believe in your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask all this in his name. Amen. I think you're all aware that there are some significant differences in how to approach Bible prophecy in general and the book of Revelation in particular. How can there be such radically different ways of understanding prophecy and Uh, revelation uh, among people who all say that we affirm the Bible as God's word. Better question than that is even this. How can we sort out which approach is the best approach to Scripture, especially revelation, especially prophecy? It, It all goes back to a fancy word. You've probably heard the word before. Maybe you haven't, but a word we don't use in our everyday speech too often hermeneutics. You love that word? It's, it's a great word. It's not someone's name. Hermeneutics. Uh, hermeneutics is simply the science of interpretation. It's a fancy word for that. It determines the rules which are legitimate in the interpretive process and those which are not. So there's different principles involved with hermeneutics. And really understanding uh, prophecy, understanding God's covenant relationship with with Israel, for instance, understanding the book of Revelation, all those things uh, go back to hermeneutics, how we interpret these portions of God's word. Churches which go back to the Reformation heritage uh, all had a basic, similar understanding of how to interpret the word of God. Oftentimes it's called grammatical, historical interpretation or hermeneutics. And uh, this term is very descriptive. You look at the grammar of how, how the grammar is in the languages, and you look at the words used, and you look at the history, the background involved in a passage, and you look at the context, and all those things you bring together to interpret the Word of God. Some of the central truths of the Reformation were emphasized, highlighted, stood firm on because of this general approach to how to understand the Word of God. Grammatical, historical, hermeneutics, or interpretation. So these these churches, we all came 
I shouldn't say we all, many churches came out of the Reformation. I would say Heartland Bible Church, broadly speaking, is a church that comes out of the Reformation heritage. We affirm as a church the different solas or onlys of the Reformation. For instance, sola scriptura, that means scripture alone. That's our authority. Uh, Sola gratia, by grace alone. That's how we're saved. It's by grace alone. Sola fide, by faith alone. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone. Solas Christus, by Christ alone. And soli dea gloria, to God alone be the glory. So we affirm all those things. So in that sense, we're a Reformation uh, background church. But out of these churches that came out of the Reformation, and we, we have the same basic theological heritage, and there is this same basic approach to Scripture, uh, one of the big differences is how do you approach prophetic texts? How do you approach Revelation? How do you understand the covenants that were give, given in the Old Testament? Thank you, Don. Uh, do you still follow the same basic form of interpretation that you would look at, say, the Gospel of John or the Epistle to Ephesians, grammatical, historical interpretation or hermeneutics, or when it comes to prophecy uh, or looking at the covenants or looking at the promises from the Old Testament, do you shift at that point to a form of typological interpretation? which would lead to non-literal fulfillments? Or do you shift to an approach that spiritualizes these Old Testament covenants or promises or, or prophecies? That, that's where it really comes down to. We have basically that same approach among Reformation heritage churches, grammatical, historical. Boy, if you come out of this message today without knowing the words grammatical, historical, you're not listening. So this is my fourth time saying that grammatical, historical interpretation. We all have that same basic approach, but, but the, the division comes when it comes to do we still understand prophecy, the covenants of the Old Testament, promises from the Old Testament, revelation. Do we still use those same basic principles to understand that, or do we look to more, uh, at, at times, spiritualizing Old Testament truths and prophecies? Well, maybe you're thinking, well, maybe it could just be a flip a coin. And uh, that's how I figured out which way to go. Or my church background is in the one way, so I'll keep going that way. Or my church background is another way, so I'll keep interpreting that way. I don't know why. I just do it. I think there's more than just that that we can look to. I, I think there's some ways that we can look at how the Bible itself interprets prophecy to help us to understand which is a good way of approaching prophecy and the covenants and uh, the book of Revelation. All this comes from the passage that we're looking at this morning. I take it the same basic way that we would interpret other non-prophetic portions of the Word of God, we should use that same basic approach to interpreting prophecy, covenants, promises from the Old Testament and the book of Revelation. And, and, and we're looking at, especially this morning, as we introduce the book of Revelation, that's where we're talking about this, but it fits with Romans chapter 1 and verse 7 especially. Look down there in your Bibles. Romans chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. It's talking of Jesus here. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. As John writes these things from the Isle of Patmos, he refers back to, he's not quoting them, but he's referring back to two different Old Testament prophecies. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, and Zechariah 12 verse 10. We're especially going to focus on the Zechariah passage this morning as, as we're just looking at, well, in the Bible itself, is, is there some clues on how we should understand prophecy? Should we take it literally? Should we not take it literally? In this passage, I take it, we see, yes, you should take it literally. 
Uh, first, Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. I'll just, you, you can turn there. I'm going to put it on the screen. But Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, uh, the prophet Daniel saw towards the end of time, he saw how the Son of Man would come in, in a visionary. Daniel had this vision of the Son of Man coming. There's this prophecy of the end of time where the Son of Man is going to come and uh, putting it in the language that we're familiar with, come and wipe out the Antichrist and his kingdom at the end of time. But look what it says in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. Now, not right now, but after you get home today or maybe this week, Daniel chapter 7 would be a great chapter to read through that whole chapter uh, this afternoon or this week sometime. But these two verses, Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14, they're a great summary of what we're going to see uh, by the time we get to the end of the book of Revelation. By that time, by the time we get to the end of the book of Revelation, God's kingdom will come to this earth. And his kingdom will never pass away. It's never going to be destroyed. Uh, what we call the millennial kingdom of Revelation chapter 20 will merge into the eternal kingdom. It'll never end. No one will ever beat it. Once it comes, it is here, never to be destroyed. But the process begins with Daniel 7, verse 13. Behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. Jesus highlights himself as the one who will fulfill this passage. And, and he highlights this uh, in four different portions of the Gospels. Uh, three of these passages are in reference to what's called the Olivet Discourse. That just means that this is towards a day or two or three. I'm not sure. I, can't, I should have looked this up. But shortly before Jesus was crucified, he gave the Olivet Discourse. It was on Mount Olivet, or the Mount of Olives. And his disciples asked, well, what are, what are the signs of your coming? What are the signs of the end of the age? And in that discourse, Jesus answered that question. And one of the things he said in Mark chapter 13, verse 24, Jesus is talking now. He said, in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be marked, darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds, with great power and glory. Okay, this, this is Jesus. And that's that Daniel 7, verse 13, where it says he's coming with the clouds. The Son of Man is coming with the clouds. Okay, Jesus says, this is me. When I come back, this is how it's going to be. The Son of Man, Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, will be coming in clouds with great power and glory. Similar passage. Uh, also from the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, verse 30. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Does that sound familiar? If you still have your Bibles open, if you look down at uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, it's very similar to this passage that Jesus gave in the Olivet Discourse. But again, this all fits with what Daniel saw way back in Daniel chapter 7. The Son of Man will be coming with the clouds of heaven. Jesus says this, the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And then Matthew 26, verse 64. As Jesus is on trial and he's answering the question of the high priest, where the high priest said, I adjure you, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus answered. Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming 
on the clouds of heaven. Again, this this basic idea brought out at at first, as far as I'm aware, the first time it's really brought out is that Daniel chapter 7 passage. But this idea, the Son of Man is coming, and he's coming on the clouds of heaven. And then finally, Luke chapter 21, verse 27, Jesus again talking here. Uh, He says, And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Jesus takes that Old Testament prophecy, Daniel chapter 7, truth, and he refers all those things, the Son of Man, and coming with the clouds of heaven, and great glory. This is me that's talking about. This is how I'm going to come back. It was not fulfilled in Jesus' first coming. So here's even just one clue. There are things that were prophesied in the Old Testament, for instance, Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14, that Jesus, before he goes to the cross, says, okay, there is going to come a day when I return, and and that will be fulfilled of me then. I will come back with the clouds and with great glory and with power. That will yet happen. This is what John highlights from Daniel 7, verse 13, at the start of Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. So first off, if we're looking just to, what's a good approach to prophecy? I think this is helpful in that we see something prophesied in Daniel. We see Daniel has this vision and he sees these things. And then Jesus, as he talks about his second coming, he picks up what was said there and he applies it to himself. And and he's clear it. This hasn't happened with my first coming. This is still yet to come. It's going to happen in the future yet. Uh, The signs of my coming, this is one of them. This is going to happen here. So, number one, there's a basic literal fulfillment that Jesus latches onto that prophecy and says, yeah, that's, that's me. Number two, there's still prophecy to be fulfilled. And it will be fulfilled when I come back. Okay, look down to Revelation chapter 1, verse 7 again. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. That's that truth from Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. But know what follows. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, Even so, amen. Just note, maybe maybe this is obvious to you, maybe not, but in case it's not, I'll let you know. Uh, This has not yet happened when John wrote Revelation. He says, uh, he is coming. Every, Every eye will see him. This is still future. This is where the date of Revelation that we talked about, I think a couple weeks ago, becomes important, about 95 A.D. This is about 25 years after Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. And Jesus' coming is still looked upon as future. He is coming, not he he came when Jerusalem was destroyed. But especially what I want you to focus on this morning is as John here in Revelation refers back to this other Old Testament prophecy, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. The context of that passage, I'm going to, I think Mike Vlock does a good job of concisely summarizing the context of that passage. He says this, Zechariah 12, verse 14 is the second burden offered by the prophet Zechariah to Israel. It's an eschatological section that predicts a coming siege of Jerusalem by the nations. This siege would result in a rescue of the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem with implications for the land of Judah. Yahweh goes forth on Jerusalem's behalf to rescue his people. He also sets up his kingdom upon the earth over the nations. See Zechariah chapter 14 verse 9. Okay, I gave you homework earlier. Read through Daniel chapter 7. Here's more homework for you. Read Zechariah chapter 12 through 14. It's a great portion of Scripture 
uh, as, as we think through just, just a broad-based picture of, of this coming kingdom, and especially, it's not clear in Zechariah, but from what we know in the New Testament, especially the return of Jesus Christ to rule and reign on this earth. Okay, Whatever the case. That's the basic context of Zechariah chapter 12. John is referring to Zechariah ch chapter 12, verse 10, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. So here's, here's that on the screen. Note how similar it is to what John writes in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Maybe you can glance down your Bible and up on the screen and back and forth a little bit. There's three parts of this prophecy. The first part, we'll call it uh, Zechariah 12.10a. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy. That's the first part of this prophecy. Second, it says, So that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced. Okay, that's, that's a portion of the prophecy also. We'll call that Zechariah 12.10b. Third, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. We'll call that Zechariah 12.10 C, third part of it. it. It's a remarkable prophecy and uh, I really could spend a lot more time on this this morning that I, you'll probably be surprised at this, you'll probably think I'm spending too much time on it, but I could spend a lot more time on it than I'm going to do. But why this is so remarkable is at the start of this prophecy from Zechariah 12, verse 10, it, God says, he's the I, God is the I speaking here, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy. It's God speaking. Uh, this is the Old Testament and prophecy uh, this is before the first coming of Jesus Christ. But then note what it says. When they look on me. So who's the me? Jesus. Jesus in this passage. I, God. God. God's talking here. It is Jesus. So whoever said that, I'm not sure, but you're exactly right. But, but God is talking. And then he says, when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced. And if you first read this prophecy and, and you think, wow, in what sense can God be pierced? How can that be? Well, I, and again, someone over here said it. It's fulfilled in God the Son, Jesus Christ, in his first coming. Okay, This is the passage that's referred to by John in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Why, why we're spending time on this is just that general approach to Scripture. How do we, how do we look upon things? Is it figurative? Is it uh, just everything spiritualized? Should we look to some kind of literal fulfillment? This is a great passage because it, it's a passage that's partially fulfilled in Jesus' first coming. And John is saying here in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, and others say this too, that there yet remains aspects of this that will be fulfilled in Jesus' second coming. So it, it, it shows us that we can approach prophecy with this basic literal sense. Uh, turn over to the Gospel of John. I, I just said part of this prophecy is fulfilled in Jesus' first coming. Uh, John chapter 19, verse 31. John chapter 19, verse 31. This is the story of Jesus' crucifixion. This morning we're uh, celebrating the Lord's Supper. We especially focus on Jesus' crucifixion, his death on the cross for our sins. And whatever all we think about that, one thing we need to remember is this was prophesied. That This didn't surprise God. These things were prophesied beforehand. John chapter 19, verse 31. Since it was the day of preparation... And so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and, they, and that they might be taken away. 
So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. And at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. This is Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. And what we're seeing here, Jesus' side was pierced. And, and, and this took place that Scripture might be fulfilled. They will look on him whom they have pierced. They pierced Jesus. And Jesus is the one who we said back in Zechariah. What a remarkable passage where it's saying, uh, God is talking, I will pour out on them the spirit of grace and pleas for mercies. And they will look on me, on him who is pierced. So even in the Old Testament, we see this prophecy of the coming uh, God-man, Jesus Christ. But Zechariah chapter 12, this is fulfilled in Jesus' first coming, at least part of it, on him whom they pierced. John brings out how this prophecy was literally fulfilled. It was prophesied that whoever this figure was, he would be pierced, this, this God figure. We know it's Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man. He was pierced. This is a partial fulfillment of what Zechariah prophesies. So first, there has to be this time when Jesus Christ was pierced, because that's what the prophecy says. It happened at his first coming. What we see in Revelation, as John cites this passage, is that just as part of that prophecy was fulfilled in Jesus' first coming, so the rest of it will be fulfilled at Jesus' second coming. This is just what we see in several Old Testament prophecies overall uh, of Jesus' first coming. They were literally fulfilled. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. What's that about? The Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. What's that about? The virgin birth. Uh, Isaiah 53. What's that about? The Messiah would die for our sins. That was prophesied. That happened. Psalm 22. The Messiah would die in a hor horrific, God-forsaken way. So all these prophecies that were literally fulfilled in Jesus' first coming, it, it should lead us to think, okay, prophecies that are yet unfulfilled, that will happen too, and in a little manner, and it will happen at Jesus' second coming. Again, to me, that's what's cool about Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Uh, we see both how part of it was fulfilled already in Jesus' first coming. He was pierced. He had to be pierced. But also John holds out the rest of the prophecy is yet to come. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Uh, Mike Vlock summarizes what we see in the New Testament usage of this prophecy from Zechariah. He says this, What can we conclude about the three uses of Zechariah 12, verse 10 in the New Testament? Zechariah 12, 10 is used contextually in all three. Zechariah 12, 10 predicts that the Messiah, as Yahweh's representative, will be pierced. Yet a day will come when a repentant nation of Israel will look upon the Messiah with a morning of repentance. John 19, verse 37, draws attention to the actual piercing of Yahweh's Messiah on the cross. He continues, So there is a partial fulfillment of Zechariah 12, verse 10, with the events of Jesus' crucifixion, as described in John 19. But Matthew 24, verse 30, and Revelation 1, verse 7, use Zechariah 12, verse 10, with expectation of future fulfillment. Thus, Zechariah 12.10b was partially fulfilled at the cross, while 12.10a and 12.10c will be fulfilled in the future with Jesus' second coming. Uh, by the way, the book I'm quoting from, The Old and the New, 
I, I, throughout Revelation, I'm going to throw out things that I think are helpful. This is called The Old and the New by Michael Locke. It's a very helpful book. It just goes through and analyzes uh, Old Testament prophecies, how they're fulfilled in the New Testament, how we look upon them. Good, Very good book if you want another resource. And just throw this out too. Uh, dispensational hermeneutics. This is that idea again of how to interpret Scripture by Michael Vlock. Both of these are really good if you want extra homework beyond uh, Zechariah 12 through 14 and Daniel 7. And you're going to come back next week tired. You got a lot of reading assigned to you this week. But why do we even care about these things? Why do I spend time on it? Major systems of understanding the end times hinge on how do we understand, how do we approach prophecy, covenants, promises, and revelation. Do we try to understand it in the same way we look at the rest of Scripture? Or do we spiritualize it or uh, make it uh, typological fulfillments? I take it by the evidence of Scripture itself, especially how things were fulfilled in Jesus' first coming, and due to the fact that God is a promise-keeping God, that we seek to understand the Old Testament prophecies and promises and covenants in the same basic way that we seek to understand the rest of the Bible. Now, that doesn't mean that no symbols are ever used. Uh, for instance, the, the great hermeneutical example is Jesus said, I am the door. Okay, do we go and think, wow, there's a door over there. Is that Jesus? No, we know that, that that represents something when he calls himself that. So we know, even as we're looking through the rest of the Bible, sometimes there are symbols that stand for other things. Yes, we, we acknowledge that as well. But bottom line, we seek to understand the prophets, the covenants, the promises, revelation, in the same basic way that we seek to understand the rest of the Bible. That's going to be my approach as I go through Revelation. And just as a side note, this isn't a big deal, but I, I take it one just practical benefit of looking to understand Scripture this way is that any believer can check out and say, like, like Paul said to the Bereans, they are more noble than the Thessalonians, I think is who it was, because they saw if these things are so. They examined the Scriptures to see if these things are so. So when I'm preaching, and if I quote a Bible verse, and if I'm talking about different things, you don't have to think, well, he just knows better, and he, can, he knows how to symbolize it better, and all, all this stuff. You can just see if these things are so. Does it say it? Does it not say it? If it doesn't say it, then call me out on it and say, Scott, it doesn't say that. Uh, but that, that's a benefit for everyone, where there's something objective that you can look at and see if these things are so. Because, uh, boy, over the years, there's been some wild interpretations of, of all of the Bible, but especially Revelation, where people just go wildly off. So, with all that said, turn back to Revelation 1, and we'll kind of draw things to a close here. Revelation 1, verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. That's what we all should be saying. Amen. He's coming. Amen. Even so, amen. I look forward to that day. Every eye will see him. There will be no doubts. Those who maybe at a point in time were just indifferent to him. Uh, those who rejected him. Those who were openly hostile to him. Everyone, they will see him at his return. It says here they'll be wailing in remorse of the judgment they'll face because of their rejection of Jesus. Now I take it, based on Zechariah 12, verse 10, that we've just been looking at, that in Israel there will be mourning and wailing right before he comes back, as God pours out on them a spirit of grace and supplication, he, he, he lets them know. Somehow they, they come to know because God pours this spirit of grace and supplication out on them. Oh, 
We did this to the Messiah. We did this to the Messiah. And right before he comes back, I take it Zechariah 12 verse 10 brings out, they recognize all the people who are left in Israel at that point in time after the whole tribulation has gone through, they will come to recognize that they had crucified their Messiah. And they'll be wailing in repentance for what they did to him. And I take it they'll be saved. But, but John brings out here, not, not just them, but every eye will see him. And in Paul's words from Philippians chapter 2, verse 10, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. All will acknowledge this, all will bow, all will confess, Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the end of time. This is Jesus' visible return to this earth. This is the day we long for, we, we look forward to. And in this passage in Revelation, we're reminded that he who came is coming. Verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I take it the connection between verse 7 and verse 8 is an implied promise from God the Father here. He will make this happen. He's the Almighty. Here we live in a time and place in which there's growing hostility to Jesus Christ. There's desire not to ever mention his name. It's too offensive. Uh, much of what we see happening in the world is a rejection of his authority. At the start of Revelation, these verses remind us this will not always be this way. Uh, a lot of times you'll hear people say, you're on the wrong side of history. This, this is the side of history I want to be on. Because this is Jesus Christ, and he will return, and every eye will see him. I want to be on his side of history. Amen. Everything you face, everything that will be coming, keep this before you with the eyes of faith. Jesus Christ will come. In his visible coming, that's what I'm talking about, Jesus Christ, in his visible return to this earth, every eye will see him, every knee will bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So as we close this morning, uh, just a question for you is, have you ever done that in your life? Uh, it, it, you, you don't want to be in the position then of wailing and weeping and mourning of the judgment that's coming. Now is the time. Bend the knee. Acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and King. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your precious word, and we thank you for the gift of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and we thank you that we have hope in this world, that it's not always going to be this way, and if things continue to go from bad to worse in this world, that's not the end of the story. Your son Jesus and his return, that is the end of the story. We long for that day. We look forward to that day. We affirm what Jesus said. You are the Almighty and Jesus is coming. Help that to impact our daily lives. Whatever else we're seeing, help us to remember you're the Almighty, you're on your throne, and we're your children. Father, if there be anyone here this morning who's never received your son Jesus, would you uh, touch their hearts? Would you help them to understand that this same Jesus who's coming then is the one who first came at his first coming and was pierced and died on the cross for their sins and rose again from the dead so they can be forgiven, they can have eternal life, and they can have a relationship with you. Oh, Father, please, if, if any are here today, if any are listening today who've never done so, help them to repent and believe in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we ask these things. Amen.